S M H. I'm sorry, I'm S-M-H. trying to. M H. And what I... were you doing, Kendall? What... I'm putting pictures on my PowerPoint. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Likely story. A likely story. I am. I promise. <laughs> No, I'm excited. I found something cool and I'm excited to talk about it. Lit. Max, what are okay. you drinking today? Uh, I'm drinking orange juice out of my Dodgers souvenir cup. Wow. Yeah. I have two of them at my desk right now. Big okay. Yeah. Claire, your hair looks good. Did you get Thank a haircut? you. Did you get a haircut? <laughs> I, I did. Um, yeah. I think last week my hair was cut. Oh, nice. I think, yeah, but it is. It's shorter. I'm much happier with it. It was my first haircut since probably last winter. Um, Whoa. Yeah, Whoa. That's exciting. Many well, actually, I, it was my first professional haircut since last winter. My <laughs> mom had cut my hair and some peers had cut my hair. Mm. Some peers, huh? Peers. <laughs> um, yes. Mm. I need a haircut. Mm. I'm jealous. Yeah, you're you're getting a little blinded by your bangs. I am. I'm very blinded by my bangs. My bangs. Yes. My the bangs. Yes. Bling. Do you guys know the word bruh? Originated uh, in. Oh. I thought no, you were just was, saying, did we not, know it? And I was no, like, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm trying to find the origin of it. It's like early did they say 20th century. In England? They did. Yeah, I think it's like an early 20th century thing. To say bra? Well, not to say it as we do today, but I think that was the first use. Um, that would be funny. Yes. But. And then it doesn't, they don't even fit on my glasses. I, to, okay. I could put a hat on like a weirdo inside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not worth it. I, like a weirdo. I'm already so warm though. I'm not doing that. Um, it's really warm here today. We, there's no AC here and I can't have the fan on while we're recording. So I'm just going to sweat. Here, uh, buddy. Hoodie, so, yeah, yeah, Savage. and I'm in a hoodie. Well, I just didn't have time to change. <laughs> it's you fine. Were editing your Google a big day. What? You were editing your Google PowerPoints. Yeah. Well, I just we had the PowerPoint at school today. I'm the PowerPoint, the promotion at school today for the sixth graders. That's cute. Um, it was so many things happened. Um. And I worked a lot yesterday too for my mother to make sure it all happened. But it's over. Yay. Thank it's, God. What is what exactly is over? The, the work? sixth grade promotion. So uh, the work about that. So okay. I'll just have normal work. Oh, but you still days. have yeah, okay. And then I have summer school, which is just Yeah. Easy. Yeah, and we get to do, like, fun topics, like, fucking, we did, like, camping, and, like, I mean, I don't know what my teacher's gonna do, but, yeah. Is this summer school for these kids, like, a, like, are they doing classes, or is it really, like, a glorified daycare? It's kind of glorified daycare, but they also say it's to make sure that kids that need it are, like, ready for the next school year. Mm, So it's, like, kind of review slash getting ready there you go um so but for the little ones it's daycare but like there's some math like they do learn things they just don't really know they're learning i mean except when they do like worksheets and shit you know yeah you get it you trick them into learning Mm -hmm. yeah yeah not that hard dude (laughs) <laughs> I was like someone brought up uh said Castro because that's one of the teachers names and I was like oh you know Fidel Castro and and they were like no and so then I told them about Fidel Castro you should so. tell them 
about all Castro related topics. I didn't tell them a lot. <laughs> they were second graders. He was the sick guy. I think you should train your second graders to be communists. Yeah. I was like, I feel like this is too political, and then I regretted saying anything about Castro. You should be like, Castro was like... Because I don't want to get in trouble with parents. Yeah. 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 We're turning their kids into commies. So. Yeah. Could be kind of lit, though. Yeah. So, Max, you went to San Francisco, didn't you? I did. How was it? It's pretty good. Um, yeah. You know, we did some things. Went to a bar mitzvah. How was it? pretty lit oh. oh shit it's katie lee Hello, it's katie, katie lee Hello. it's katie Hi. lee Hello? Hello. do you speak up can you hear me yeah. oh no yeah yeah, yeah. Hey. am i clear we can't yeah, see you but you we can hear you you can hear me and i'm clear yeah uh, Oh my oh, god, it's Katie. No. Oh, oh my god, god. Wait. Katie. Hold on. Wait, oh I need god. to change this. I need to change this. Oh god, okay, oh here. Oh my god, it's Katie. That, that was, was a different was... background, and I was like, why do you have that story? <laughs> and I was like, it's your wall. Katie Lee? Yeah. <gasps> How are you? I haven't Katie seen Lee? you in a long time. Guys, I haven't seen you guys in forever. Oh my god. Welcome to our new podcast. <laughs> Okay, can I just say how much I love it? Oh. <laughs> I seriously, oh, wait, first, is there, yeah. do I need to do anything on my end? Do you need me no, to like- No, it's fine. I, I've i learned that using Zoom's recording works just mm. fine. So unless Zoom okay. like fails me, we'll be fine. Katie's our number one fan. I, no, I seriously am. I seriously am. I really That's enjoyed great. the most recent Thank episode. You. It was fun. We're getting spicier and spicier. We are getting spicier. Um, No, I seriously really love it. It was really funny. Sinclair's last week said something about like, um, like described looking at the altarpieces like unboxing, and I was like, that'd be funny if people did altarpiece unboxing videos. (laughs) I would. Oh, and then Kendall, you just like was like, oh. The Fagnard, Bob Ross. <laughs> well, I just, I don't know why. I was just looking at the trees and I was like, but. No, they totally why do. Why does this look, look like, like Bob, Bob Ross? Ross? Yeah. But then I was like, the whole time after that, I just couldn't stop it because I saw something on Instagram that Bob Ross's divorce was caused by him, like. I didn't know he got like, divorced. Playing around with the ladies and stuff. And I was like, what if Bob what? Ross taught people how to make, like, really sexy affair paintings like that would be crazy wait this is a great update to that comment (laughs) (laughs) that's so interesting i had no idea i informed my mother recently that he collected squirrels she didn't know that yeah collect them well i mean no they were alive they were alive he would like nurse them to health like he'd find baby squirrels in the wild and then he would nurse them back to health and then release them that's what a wholesome thing so yeah she's not an insider i think he had birds how's korea yeah it's lovely are you ever coming back yes i'll be back in august Oh um, for God. school because yeah. school's back in session. Okay, um, back from <laughs> um, are you guys done with school? Yeah. For the semester. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes. <laughs> are are you guys going back in person in the fall? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. The world is healing slowly yeah. but surely. It's weird. Do you guys have any fun summer plans? I'm gonna go to Disneyland soon with JR, mm. I think. No travel plans or anything. No. That's I'm still kind of nervous to get on a plane, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was thinking about um, traveling that actually, it was like 
reminiscing and missing traveling that made me choose the <laughs> piece that I plan to talk about Fun. for this. So, yeah. Nice. The Let's last see. trip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get into it then? You can just start. Sure. <laughs> So the last trip that I went on um, was in 2019, Cassia invited me to go to Italy um, to, to visit her aunt and uncle who live in Rome. Um, and they're super I awesome. For some reason. Yeah, I remember the photos. I feel like I saw them. Max I was like, was they look there. like they're having a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Following closely behind, but at a safe distance. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to um, briefly go to Venice for like a couple days, just for fun, just the two of us without her aunt and uncle. And um, her, uh, I actually just saw like a memory come up of, of that. It was like, like almost exactly a year ago, I mean, two years ago. Um, but her aunt suggested we go visit something called the Biennale Arte, which I had no idea about. Um, and yeah, I had it no idea up, what you were talking about. Yeah, so are you guys familiar with La Biennale? Mm -mm. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it was founded in 1895. So it's an old exhibition that's been going on. It founded in Venice. Um, and it's like original sole purpose was to um, highlight modern art. And like they didn't necessarily want to have um, the artists or the work have like geographical or cultural ties necessarily. It was to showcase like the work itself. Um, and it was just like a way for artists to be appreciated without being like, have it be pieces that were commissioned or like pieces of propaganda artwork and stuff like that. And so it was just, um, primarily paint paintings. Um, and then in 1930, they added on um, a music festival for contemporary music. And then in 1932, they founded the Venice International Film Festival, which is still live and well, all of this is still live and well. Wow. Um, but it was the very first film festival in history, which is really cool. Um, and then in 1934, they added theater. In 1980, they added architecture. And then in, um, 99, they added modern dance, contemporary dance. Um, so the Biennale is just this kind of like full on all encompassing art exhibit. Um, what don't they have? Foundation. Podcast. Nothing. <laughs> ha. Podcasts. They don't have. Oh God. Honestly, at this rate, they might <laughs> add podcasts eventually. But that whole like not having like not being identified by your country or having like being like distinguished by your country still kind of holds true and still um is kind of in effect today um based off of just like no, them not creating like political pieces um but they definitely cover culture and identity and, and race and, and just like general socio-political um, messages, lots of bottom-up nationalism energy because, you know, mm. lots of bottom-up energy. Um, and it, basically the Biennale has a really long, like century plus history and um, has had 58 um, exhibitions. And I, the 58th one was the one that we went to in 2019. Um, and I'm here to tell you that was the best one, um, even though I haven't gone to any of the other ones. The 2019 one, it was curated by Ralph Rogoff, who's some, not some, <laughs> no offense, Ralph Rogoff, you're not just some guy, but you're, um, <laughs> uh, he's an American guy uh, who's currently the director of the Hayward um, in London. The title of the 58th Biennale in 2019 was May You Live in Interesting Times, 
which I think is like the most uh, interesting part of the whole exhibit and kind of creepy because I like read a blurb on like the why they decided to go with that name and the actual like president of the Biennale, Paolo Barata, um, said in his statement in 2019 that the exhibition could be like interpreted as a sort of curse and then like other people um, unrelated to the staff and execs at the Biennale like were mistaken mistakenly referencing it to um, an ancient Chinese curse that like when you translate it into English means interesting times which is supposed to like invoke crisis and turmoil and like menacing times and then 20 2020 happened um wow. so it makes you think did the Biennale you know curse the world and make 2020 happen we don't know <laughs> probably not <laughs> <laughs> but it's he said like it was an invitation to um consider humans and their complexity and for um the visitors to and and the artists themselves like the, so these are themes for the for the artists either select the work that they've already made or to create new work within this theme and it was to quote um like to take what things seem like oversimplified due to like conformism and like fear of the world and fear of like being different or fear of thinking and to tear them apart and and really dig deep into them so those were like the overarching themes and they were challenged to like extract the very few few strands um of complexity from an otherwise very apprehensive sheep herd world that we live in. Um, and then through that challenge back to their viewers made us try to extract the complexity from their artwork, which like on the surface looks really simple because contemporary art, you know, you see a canvas with just green paint and you're supposed to extract meaning from that or not. Sometimes contemporary art is not meant to take a lot of things out of it. There were so many different pieces that were really interesting, but for some reason, I don't know why, because I'm not like a video art person or anything, but I was really drawn to all the video art pieces, which is not paint on canvas. It's just a bunch of not even tape and they're also long and that's not fun to watch. But um, I encourage you guys to go look through their archives and and check out all the video art pieces. There was like pieces by Ad, Ed Atkins, who's this really cool guy. But anyway, <laughs> um, the piece I chose is one that Sia and I literally saw from a distance and then <laughs> there were like a lot of people around it. But we were like, eh, that doesn't look interesting. And we walked away, which I feel a little bad about. But it is called L'Ange du Foyer, um, translated to the Fireside Angel. Um, and it's, are, are you familiar with L'Ange du Foyer? Because it's not this installation. It's actually created from a, a, a painting, an oil on canvas painting by Max Arn. I'm really butchering that name, um, but he's a German artist who is like, was part of the group of people who were like the fathers of Dadaism. And he was really interesting. He's like a really well-versed, really well-educated. His dad was like an educator. He was like a Freud guy, one of those guys. Um, and a lot of his works weren't directly political, but like had a lot of political meaning. And here, I should probably show it, right? Yeah, That's how you guys do it. Yeah, let me know okay. if you can't share. Oh, we got 10 downloads. Look at that. Whoa, that's- Oh, the podcast? 
Yeah, I just got an That's email about it. Number. Oh, yeah, these are yeah. paintings. Okay, cool. So it's the first one. That one is by Max Ernst. Kendall, I think Kendall was the one in the last episode was talking about how like the Bible describes angels to be oh, these yeah. like freakish things. Mm -hmm. um, this here is is an angel. It's quite freaky and it has, you know, hints of beaks and claws and wings, which make you feel like it's something that you could kind of like sort of know. Like you, you, don't, you don't look at it and you're like, oh, that's just a blob. Like you don't understand what it is. There's some sort of, um, there's something about it that that's relatively familiar. It looks kind of like an animal. It looks kind of like depictions of monsters and stuff like that, um, which I'll get to in a second. Yeah, it's kind of dinosaur-y looking. What are, you, what are your initial reactions to it, like, emotionally? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you, you look at, you try to, like, focus in on parts, and you're like, wait, no, that's, then you go to a different part, and then you're like, wait, I'm not getting it. <laughs> like, I don't know if that makes sense. No, like, I it, oh, yeah. It's like, like, you're like, your, your brain is telling you to like look for the detail to understand it but like you just kind of it sends you in circles when i first saw it at the biennale it i'll talk about, i'll talk about that in a second but okay. it, even the actual installation it was kind of freaky looking and then when i looked at this painting it was like is scary um but it's like kind of the expressions kind of meant to be like joyous <laughs> and like it's kind of supposed to be like an expression of like being alive yeah, and it was like, yeah I was just gonna say was, it looks like he's dancing a little bit yeah, yeah. so it's just really twisted just like unsettling kind of thing going on um and he it was actually surprise like a political response so he um he made it um, in response to the Spanish Civil War, just to like reflect the chaos going on in Europe and stuff like that. And it was a critique on all the people who he said were labeling or like naming monsters as angels. And you, so- Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but could you like describe it so the people that are just listening know what we're looking at? Cause I really- yeah. Like it probably so, is very confusing. <laughs> yes. Um, it's like this vast open field, lots of sky with this like leaping sort of flying sort of jumping sort of dancing creature that's supposed to be a depiction of an angel, but it actually looks like a freaky monster with, it looks like it's supposed to have four limbs kind of human-like there aren't necessarily wings and what looks kind of like clothes also kind of look like fleshy exposed bits of like muscle tissue that's tattered and and flapping away in the wind um and then also it like kind of looks like it's wearing shoes it kind of looks like it has claws it kind of looks like it has this kind of um leech giant monster also attached to it and it looks like it could be singing and happy but it also looks like it's kind of an excruciating pain so it's just this really contradictory upsetting but also like kind of soothing because everything about it is like physically very smooth even though like there's a lot of sharp points everything just feels like it's soft which is interesting mm -hmm. yeah I'm not an art historian I don't know how to I've never taken like no, a proper so art good. history class um I thought that was a great description but also <laughs> I I do want to note there's like also a large like flower thing at the crotch area that maybe looks like a vagina or something yeah yeah I didn't notice that I didn't I know I didn't like <laughs> associate it to be we're all about that here oh yeah 
notice everything has some sort of <laughs> sexual tie. Well, yeah. that feels like the focal point to me. Like that's and what I feel like is the brightest on canvas. <laughs> on that's, <page>. true. <laughs> that's true. And the creature's like looking down at their crotch. Yeah. Which also draws you to it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if you're yeah. saying this is like meant to be about like vitality, that could make sense. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a it's kind of a slap in the face at his whole intention was to like title it something that, that is familiar and comforting. That's supposed to be like a symbol of of protection and 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 vitality. But then how when you look at it, you're like, oh, what what is that? It's not supposed to be so scary where you're like, oh, I understand what he's going for. He's he's you know creating this really gruesome monster with like a contrasting name you're supposed to look at it and be like hmm am I, am I supposed to feel like kind of happy about this it's like this whole idea the whole idea of like you can believe one thing um and if you like strongly believe about it it can be that thing if you strongly believe that really awful person in power is like a great person then in, in your mind, they're a great person, that kind of thing. But it's it's definitely like an anti-Franco, Francisco Franco kind of slap in the face piece. And yeah, so this is the painting that Cyprien Gaillard used. He's a French artist. He's young and hip and cool. And he does a lot of video art installation work. But this was interesting because he used an, an old painting and turned it into this LED holographic sculpture oh, um sick. yeah and so just like solely based off of the materials and that were used and the medium that was used like it's already challenging that like the clashing idea of nature versus like invention which was like a big it, that theme would come up a lot in all of the artists at the Biennale and at um that year and he intended for it to um he he described it as like reflect the entropy between both human made and natural and he's all about like clashing and destruction so in terms of like the things that are human made it's an led projection and it's something you can't touch the colors themselves are like vibrant and inorganic literally surreal because it's a surrealist painting um but I remember it being kind of small it moves so if you go to the next one you can see it moving at its like mm. furthest points it's apparently like 160 centimeters and then like 75 by 30 this way uh, for this people just listening I'm moving my hands like <laughs> to show the width uh, but I remember from afar it kind of looked like a projection of like a beating heart <laughs> obviously my I need to get my eyes checked out but um <laughs> it's like it was like bright red and bright blue which are aren't colors like in our body but it's also what you're taught when you're like a seventh grader in seventh grade anatomy like it it looks like a like a very typical graphic of like a heart. So I thought it was a beating heart, but it wasn't. And I, and I was like, oh, I don't really know what that is. I'm gonna walk away. But even though they're like, they're not like natural colors, there is something that made me think, oh, it's, it's related to something natural. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that it's a moving sculpture. It looked alive. It looks like it should be like morphing from one thing to another. It, and, and like it's kind of like being attacked and then resurrecting right back where it started like right back to suffering and like being engulfed by the wind the the Biennale like, described his work as like the visual archaeology of decay so like this whole concept of destruction and then reconstruction is exactly what he's going for and then the fact that he's like the creature comes right back to be to like this kind of suffering state is meant to be a critique on the concept of progress. Cyprien Gaillard is like really <laughs> anti the idea of progress. He doesn't like fully agree that the common like definition of progress is real. 
basically like that the world is so flawed and cyclical that there's no way to move forward you're just in a constant cycle and then he's like the only way to break out of this cycle and the only way to make true progress is to just like completely start fresh just like utter destruction um of mankind and the world and and only then will we be making progress so really dark he makes really dark but thoughtful things it was it, this was part of a three-part installation and the other ones were, were more video art like pieces and it was inspired by Plato's allegory of the cave if you guys are familiar with that um it's this idea that like prisoners are trapped inside a cave and then on the wall they see like figures moving and they're like hooray like people are here to save us um but then the one prisoner that like breaks loose goes and finds out to see that the the figures moving on the wall were just like puppets um created by shadows by like a fire so he's like oh that's like the, the people with the help were not real um and so he like escapes goes out to the real world and he's like oh my gosh the world outside is so much more real than the cave but then because he was in the cave for so long he's blinded by the light outside and when he comes back to tell all of his friends friends prisoners the outside world is so much more real um and, and it won't trick you the people inside the cave are like you're lying you're blind the outside world's harmful believing that life inside the cave is more real and, and, and better and more safe. So it makes sense why he chose this painting, because going back to that whole idea of like belief versus knowledge, the whole like monsters, naming like believing monsters are angels. He touches on like the shadows, fire and, and light, which are, are like the three points of knowledge in Plato's theory. And this piece is the fire. It's supposed to look kind of like a flickering flame, all those fleshy bits flying around. Yeah, I don't know. I thought it was really cool because it's kind of everything and also nothing at the same time. Like it's cinematic animation, it's technically sculpture, it's installation art, but there's also paint and fine art qualities to it because he literally uses a painting and, and just aesthetically it looks he, I mean he's literally using a painting so of course it'll look aesthetically like a painting but um at the end of the day at the end of the day it's just a hologram um there's nothing there it's really meta <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the whole concept of all the works at the Biennale were just really interesting like how like crisis and, and turmoil affect art and, and the artists who create it and I guess more importantly like the the anticipation of crisis and turmoil inspiring art or like trying to predict things that haven't occurred yet but then it made me kind of think like are all like incredible artistic movements and and inc incredible art pieces created only in in response to or in or by predicting crisis like can like cool art be created within crisis because like all I can think about was when everyone was in lockdown and stuff like that I feel like the extent of creativity was like how to make the best banana bread in the microwave <laughs> like I don't I didn't feel like anybody was there was a whole when you're in a when it really comes down to it and you're in crisis I don't think you have time to you know be coming up with the next incredible art movement but you know someone can someone should prove me wrong or maybe I haven't I haven't looked into it quite yet um enough yet. but I feel like that's just kind of the pattern in in like for surrealism and then like I feel like impressionism is like every teacher's favorite example of like going against something like going like responding to something like going against academia or going like reinventing rules but that's because they have rules to work off of like what kinds of things will be made can be made 
when all the rules and all the foundations just kind of swept up from under you. I don't know. It was just what I was, and that's what I've been thinking about lately. But yeah. It was very well said, Katie. Yeah, agree. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. It's been That's so fun. wild. Yeah. It's a really cool piece. Mm -hmm. I wish I appreciated it more when I was there in person. Yeah. You get to watch it over and over again like this. Yeah. I'm sorry, Supreme Kyrd. I I underestimated you. <laughs> I saw your work and I was like, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> I walked right, right away. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe that's supposed to be a thing too. Who knows? Everything means something, right? It, everything means something. Mm -hmm. Unless it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> yeah that was so cool I have I'm just like stunned I'm like <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of did you guys Kendall you were mentioning that you're gonna choose oh that's another thing listeners yeah. these three fool you <laughs> I when they say that they're surprised by something or or they're just coming up with something <laughs> off the cuff on a whim they're being very real because i try to share all my notes and all my my plans with them beforehand and kendall was like no <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I, didn't... I told kendall who i was researching because i didn't mm -hmm. want to overlap with her yeah but usually i don't even know what she's gonna do no i didn't know who you were doing i didn't know the name so yeah, yeah that's as far as we go it's like <laughs> the name of <laughs> yeah so it's more fun that way. Yeah. And we are so. all learning from each other. Plus, it's like, are we going to do the whole thing twice? Like, that's a lot of time. <laughs> you know? That's true. So, we keep it raw. Yeah, no. No rehearsal. Mm -hmm. we hang out I applaud you guys. <laughs> so much respect. Oh. I want to also maybe at the end or something you can tell us what like movie things you're doing. Yeah. I'm curious. But yeah. And I'll that. update on that. Yeah, I saw your like storyboard posts on Instagram. I was like, ooh. Oh yeah, that was that was I've we I've decided that I need to be more professional just in life. Um and that so many opportunities come through social media now. Mm. Um, which I was like super against that I've look at me sheep person yeah um, you kind of have to be I'm, I decided I'm, I'm going to make my Instagram kind of a portfolio mm -hmm. that's old that's a storyboard from my junior thesis film that oh, okay. was a disaster oh. <laughs> that's okay why? Um, I had to do it completely alone. Like, li like uh, when I say alone, I, I literally mean alone. Um, and there's no actors in it. It's five puppets, marionette puppets. Oh, that sounds very different. Oh, I remember you posting lots of puppets. And I was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> and so maneuvering five puppets at the same time and a camera and lights, <laughs> just physically not possible. Um, so toes um, and elbow pits were used quite a bit in the in the making of the film. Oh my God. Teeth. Wait. It was it was a it was a very um, wow. physical. I want to rewatch it now, like knowing that. <laughs> I haven't shared the full thing anywhere. Oh, okay. I don't I want anybody like... to see it. Oh, I want to see it though. Now I'm like, I want to see Katie maneuver Marionette with her elbows. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. behind the scenes would have been more interesting. <laughs> it was sad. My mom walked into the room and she was like, 
this is so sad <laughs> like a person <laughs> the thing is it's at, at one point my mom was holding like everything on one side of the room and I was like holding up everything on the other side um but it's hard it was hard but it's oh. over yeah I have five puppets that um are sitting in my closet okay, I don't know right. what to do with them hmm. yeah. maybe I should is that kind of a waste I put so there's literally like lit literal blood sweat and tears in those puppets well, I feel like you gotta keep it then yeah I think I'm gonna keep it. if you ever need puppets if anybody needs puppets I have a variety of five different types um, Great. I'll rent them to you all our puppet needs puppets. all right well Sinclair you want to do your I thing all righty boys so I'm going to share my screen because this is cool and we can look at art while I talk. And go for it. Um, okay. So oh. I also got excited about looking at queer non-white artists this yeah. week. Um, and I found Micheline Thomas. I think that's how you pronounce her name. But she is a queer Black woman. She is American. She was born in 1971 in New Jersey. So she is my parents' age. I don't know how old your parents are, but she's my parents' <laughs> And um, she does a lot of work um, in this sort of like painting collage -y, mixed media style. Um, this is the work of hers I've chosen and it's like uh, based on a photograph, but it's paint and it's a couple different kinds of paint and it's got like rhinestones. So sort of like large scale mixed media collage -y type works. I think pretty much all of her works, the subjects are black women. And so she's really focused on themes of like black femininity and sexuality. And uh, some of her works are of black female celebrities. So she had, she actually made the first individual portrait of Michelle Obama, which is down here. And it's in the National Portrait Gallery, which is kind of cool. She also has some fun, like, like a lot of her style is sort of playing off of art history works and sort of the art historical canon and looking at like depictions of women and sort of inserting black women into those like feminine roles and feminine like dignity and femininity and sort of playing on tropes of femininity in the canon and sort of subverting that or sort of putting black women into that narrative and also sort of playing with concepts like the male gaze um, with her as a very different gaze as a queer Black woman and sort of using her Black female subjects and their ability to take up space in her work and have agency and feel very powerful in these like feminine sexual roles also. So that's super cool. And so the painting I chose is this one. Kendall, will you say it in French? Uh, le déjeuner sur l'herbe. Oh, that's the other picnic one where there's the that's naked true. people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and, this, and uh, Les Trois Femmes Noires. Yeah. So this is like the luncheon on the grass, the three black women. Um, and this is from 2010. And this is like the final stage of a three stage work. So it's based on this photograph, which she took of three of her friends. Um, and this is in the sculpture garden at MoMA. Um, mm -hmm. So back here, there's a Matisse sculpture that is like actually in the site and it's I'll show you the sculpture this is the Matisse sculpture that is behind them if anyone was wondering it's over there and so this is kind of cool because it was she was commissioned to create this large-scale work to be housed at MoMA I think it started in like their restaurant at MoMA so it was sort of visible from the street and also in the restaurant and got like a lot of viewership and was very public and so she created this work as sort of a site specific piece by creating the photograph in the sculpture garden at the place where it would mm -hmm. then be seen. Also um, very meta. Yeah, which is kind of cool. And so she was very like aware of the museum space as setting, which is also sort of important of like putting powerful large black women into this space. This yeah. final product is huge. What museum did you say again? Mama. Oh, okay, cool. And so like the, the, this thing is 10 feet by 24 feet long, huge. It's like a big giant wall. And so like these black women are larger than life. They like 
literally take up space in the room and they're sort of like staring you down sizing you up they're dressed in these like really vivid cool prints that she actually designed the clothes herself and like throughout her career fashion is like a big inspiration for her she draws a lot of themes from her works and like designs and there's a lot of sort of if you look up just like generally her work there's a lot of sort of things that look like textiles and cool prints and lots of that in her like more collage type works um, so you have all these prints you have these women with their natural hair and like really bold vivid makeup all sort of as symbols of femininity but also like of their power and assertiveness and like these women are not shy they're not hiding away from the the viewer's gaze they're looking right back at you and so that's sort of like a, a symbol of this like black feminine power in her works and yeah so this painting and then the, the middle stage of this is this sort of like mm. photograph collage which is in um like MoMA has, I guess, like kind of installation galleries. Um, and this is, this is also really big and it's in one of those at MoMA. So it's sort of like that through line of this being a site specific work in a way. Yeah, so this painting is a reference to this Manet from 1863 of the same name. And this painting, so we have two clothed men and two Originally nude women, I think this one in the back was sort of like drawn on in clothes, but they were both nude, I think, at at the time of painting. And this at the time was like really controversial because this is not a thing people were doing. And it feels kind of like weird and awkward and promiscuous and like, what's going on here? And especially that this woman is looking directly at the viewer was seen as like, like there was a lot of chatter about this um, mm -hmm. and people were very unhappy with it because she was seen as sort of like too promiscuous. Like, why is she looking at me? I feel really uncomfortable. Stop mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so Thomas is clearly like playing on this in her work of like this, the mané being sort of indicative of the male gaze of looking at this like nude woman, but also of her looking back and that sort of causing a stir. And then in her work, if I can go back, it's not letting me go back. That's fine. Whatever. Come back. Um, these women sort of looking back at you and sizing you up in a very different way since they're looking at a friend, they're looking at a fellow Black woman, but also like they have power over you as the viewer because of their like sheer size in the room sort of turns that the image of the man eye on its head, which I think is cool. And there is a lot, of, she does a lot of this in her work, sort of turning art history, canonical works, like on their heads, subverting them using like classical poses or sort of things that would be recognizable from the canon and putting black women in those narratives, changing those narratives, sort of changing narratives of oppression to become like symbols of black femininity and black power, which is kind of cool within our our context of talking about our history. And yeah, so the, she like copies this composition. This back woman um, is sort of replaced by the Matisse sculpture, which I read an interview with her and it seems like this is this composition sort of happened naturally in the space. And I also read that she often like references Matisse and other artists in her work. So it's like not an exception that this Matisse like takes up space in this work. So I don't know, I thought she was super cool. Lots of like reclaiming agency for black women, reclaiming femininity for black women and sort of playing off the art historical canon um, to do that and to do that in like fancy high end museum spaces um, where black women traditionally do not take up space both as artists and as subjects. So yeah, that's what I did um, on McLean Thomas. And I think she's super cool. So there you I have some thoughts. Yes. Um, I, that's so cool. Also, um, this is weirdly has so many parallels to mine, which is oh very fitting. I, I wanted to say too, like the, the photograph one looked a lot, like reminded me of, I don't remember which country they're from. Um, maybe Nigeria or the Congo. I think it was the Congo peoples, the like, it was one of the AP works, like the sculptures that are small and like usually 
phallic and they would like sometimes put nails in them and stuff there were lots of wood sculptures like that um like figures is that what you're talking about yeah mm -hmm. and they used to oil those with um what kind of oil is it i don't remember but they would oil the sculptures as like kind of a ritualistic thing if i remember right and like, because they seemed like oiled and probably it was just to catch the light and stuff. Like it kind of reminded me of that. And those were also like often royal depictions and kind of like idolized. So it was like kind of a fun parallel. But yeah. Did you have your hand up, Max? Or were you copying? I did have my hand up. Okay. <laughs> um, do you know what the, I mean, do you know the significance of like her holding the flower i don't um it's possible that it's like a like a femininity thing oh it's an end up portrait that's what they're called and it's nikisi and kondi and it is the congo peoples what okay sorry that's what i was thinking mm -hmm. yeah i'm not sure because i guess i mean this is like part of the composition right. of the thing, but oh. My no, best just went on by itself. Flowers are like a like a tie to feminine. Right, right. Also, was so was the phase like the first phase that was in the restaurant, right? Um, I'm not sure. Or was it the third, like part three? I think it might be this one. Okay. I kind of um, like the camera one better. All, like Person. created based on the photograph. Yeah. They're all really cool. How many pictures? Yeah, they are all really cool. Yeah. What were you gonna say? I just wonder how many pictures they took that day to choose that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, because that one seems like perfect, and the way they talk yeah. about it, it sounds like they stumbled upon this like perfect composition. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> Well, I wonder Maybe if she's stupid lucky. I wonder if she scouted the location for the composition beforehand. Yeah, I don't know. I'd yeah. assume so, right? Isn't that what yeah. artists do? So cool. And I think I was trying to think of Le Déjeuner Célèbre, the Mene one, the other day, and I couldn't remember the name. So it made me happy that and I know we're, it now. we're also talking about Mene's Olympia with, with women. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because also he's like playing with gazes and I almost, I didn't want to be distracting, but I almost started like drawing their gazes because <laughs> I can do it. Can you see it? Yeah, I can. This is creepy, actually. It was a lot creepier than that. <laughs> but he goes this way. And then she's like over here. Yeah. It looks kind of spooky, but... I don't know. It's interesting because that none of the other people are looking and like, I guess I feel like maybe the clothes lady should be looking straight at us, but she's not, you know, because like, I don't Wait, know. It's do like you, there's four, do but draw? it doesn't match. Go to annotate in view option. I don't know if it's a host thing. It might be. Special host privileges. Yeah. Kendall's shooting lasers. I would out. argue. I would argue. I can make you all co-hosts. I would argue this rather than what? this. I think that. Oh yeah, you can do it. Oh okay. That's that's my <laughs> hot take. That's really morbid. That that. Looks yeah, like the a red is scarier. Eyes. Blood. <laughs> sure, hold on. Okay. Pouring out of her eyes. I think um, it is a really interesting change to go from this painting where it's just one gaze. Mm -hmm. where it's like kind of like everything Three. is normal but this one thing too yeah um the gaze that's just like directly challenging you mm -hmm. yeah is the matisse sculpture of a male back i think yes that's also interesting an yeah. exposed booty from the back mm -hmm. um to this replace my the gaze. <laughs> well, and replacing the clothed woman. Oh my god! <laughs> Max just drew two lines to the butt for those listening. 
pew, yes. pew, pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! I'm maybe I me. shouldn't have told Max how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Anyone not watching the YouTube video should just watch the YouTube video. No, um, just ignore. <laughs> what's yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Could I have it's shaping up to be that such a rad episode, y'all? Oh heck yeah! I'm so excited to that edit this and watch it that. all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay no I actually do genuinely enjoy like re-watching us because I tend to black out when I like present things because I get nervous and then uh, like I thought you meant black out while you watch I'm like, hey, hell yeah you I'm just drunk just, like, and you don't know while yeah. you watch the episode no I I've been like, drunk I hope not while you're editing <laughs> I've been drunk in front of you enough for says you says me know. who does no, who offers no work to the show yeah. <laughs> yeah you if anyone should be the drunk one max get it together maybe i should yeah, yeah. i rewatch them because i i've been rewatching them on double speed to find all the mm. photos oh yeah to post them on the instagram and they're actually good yeah i know i'm always surprised i'm like wow were we funny that's cool and then, <laughs> um no it's cool i'm like it makes me happy yeah no as a viewer i can say and listener, I I really thoroughly enjoy them. Yay! That's so good to hear. Um, oh, okay. Luke did say oh. that it's tough without seeing things, but who cares about the? Listener? Yeah, I mean that's that's what you know when you're when you're listening to a visual arts podcast. Like, yeah. what do you expect? Um, We're willfully. We are we're, we're, yeah. we're willfully challenging the medium we're making people mad and i like it because my dad was mad about that also if you don't like a podcast about things that you can't listen to then don't listen <laughs> well don't say that not to listen. well then um, listen but and you know follow along you know <laughs> Well, keep up. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> keep, keep up, up, guys. Get it together, listeners. Uh, you should, your setup for this podcast, this isn't just any old podcast where you click play, okay? You should have a desktop ready to look up everything we talk about. <laughs> We're going to be the podcast that you need to do homework this is for. A, this, is, this isn't a podcast. This is a self-guided <laughs> tour yeah. where you don't even have a museum, okay? <laughs> Oh my god, I love that. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk. Oh my god, look at this moment. Okay, I'm sorry. You can keep doing the eyes though. If you want to keep doing the eyes, Max, it's interesting. Oh, that one. <laughs> this is a crazy moment. Okay. Okay. I have a so, lot to say about this one. <laughs> no, there's so much. So let me I would present, probably... let me present. No, just, <laughs> <laughs> just take over, knowing nothing. Um, no, but okay. You can at the end if you want to, yeah. but um. This is a painting by uh, Kent Monkman. I'm going to talk about the actual painting in a minute, but I'm just going to talk about him first. So Max, if you want to do their gazes, you can, because it's kind of interesting. Okay. But um, So Kent Monkman is still alive. Like, I'm assuming these other artists, right? So we've got all living artists today, which is kind of fun. And because Not of that... Oh, God. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. And this guy is also born 1965, so also the age of my parents, which is the same as in Clay's, which is goofy. Um, but yeah, uh, I was going to say something else and I fully forgot, but whatever. Kent Monkman is a Cree visual artist. He's a First Nations person from Canada, which is like their version of like Native American. So he's an indigenous person, which is very cool. He's also gay. So I was like, let's go Pride Month. So, and I found, oh, I know what I was going to say. I was going to say because he's alive, I found so much information, like an overwhelming amount of information. So that's why I was like doing my notes until the last second. And I did them for like an hour and a half and all the other ones I've done for just an hour. So, <laughs> oof. but I, I'm going to try to do this briefly because we have three things today so we'll see how that goes all right so he is 
Yeah, First Nations, he is from the Fisher River Cree Nation, which is in Manitoba in Canada, in modern day Canada. And he lives specifically in the Dish with One Spoon territory in Toronto, which is such a cool name. And I really wonder why it's named that. So maybe I'll find out and tell you guys next week. All right, this is a long quote, but it's like basically one paragraph from the bio on his website. And I thought it was a good description. So here we go. Okay, Kent Monkman is known for his provocative interventions into Western European and American art history. Monkman explores of colonization, that might be wrong, sexuality, loss, and resilience. The complexities of historic and contemporary indigenous experiences across painting, film, video, performance, and installation. Monkman's gender fluid alter ego, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, who's right here in this one, Oh, this is actually not the one I'm doing. I'm doing this one, but whatever. So Miss Chief Eagle Testicle is the name. And it's not spelled like testicle, like the organ. It's like test tickle. So like, like tickle. <laughs> so that's fun. And she often appears in his work as a time traveling, shape shifting, supernatural being who reverses the colonial gaze to challenge received notions of history and in indigenous people. So she's super cool and I will definitely talk about her more. Yeah, he's exhibited art at many museums. I did not write down all of them. I only wrote down five. I think the Hayward was also one of them. So kind of cool. The Met in New York, which is where these two are, which I'll talk more about in a minute. The Musée des Beaux-Arts in Montreal. Uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Galerie. I don't know where that is, maybe in Canada also, and the National Gallery of Canada, and there were many, many more. So he's prolific, very successful. I mean, personally, I think part of that has to do with like his art, and I think he just happened to come at a time that was really perfect for this, like the contemporary art movement, like this fits right in to the canon of right now, you know, like flipping colonial art on its head, using all these historical allegories, like totally works. He also screened at many festivals. And then I just wrote gay, which I told you already. Um, okay. And then this one, I don't know why I made it small, but hopefully you guys can see it enough. This is the resurgence of the people. So these two paintings are in the Met. I should have done a floor plan. Maybe I'll, oh, whatever. It's fine. In the Met, there's like a big lobby and it's kind of rectangular in shape. And then on the closest sides to the entrance, there's two huge walls. And that's where these are. He talked about in a video I watched the way that that's a space of like entering and exiting and how that has to do with colonialism and I guess like removal of peoples also. And they're just gigantic. So again, like Sinclair is like literally taking up space. Um, in a place that they normally would have no access to. So that's really interesting. These were made in 2019. They're acrylic on canvas and yeah, they're huge. The dimensions are there. It's 132 inches by 264 and the other one's the same. Yeah, so they're in the Great Hall is what it's called. Oh yeah, and I guess this is part of a program where the Met is doing something that's a part of a new series of contemporary commissions where artists create new works inspired by the collection, inspiring a dialogue between the artist's work, the collection, the space, and audiences, which is from the Met's website. He says, I want to bring indigenous experience into this canon of art history. So that's the essential, what we're doing here, the thesis statement. Sullivan's inspiration includes, excuse me, old paintings and contemporary experiences that's all. I thought there were more, but no, <laughs> just those things. I'm sure there are more things, but that's all I wrote down. And he talks about the language of painting, how like he likes communicating through that. He also has assistants and a workshop, which we've talked about in the other episodes too. But the way that his works, and I, I don't know a whole lot about those other artists' workshops because they're all dead. I guess Warhol, there's probably information, but I don't know about it. But he has a really interesting process in which he also photographs models first, which also the photos are really cool too. And I should have included them, but it's fine. And then he moves on to canvas. And then the final step is him actually going in and like doing all the little details. And he says, pulling the painting together. So adding highlights and like really making it his, I think, which I thought was maybe a more ethical 
way to use assistance, you know, like use them for all the dirty work, but like you should be the one like giving the final like fingerprint impression say in this work, you know, cause it has your name on it. So it bothers me when people like do things and then aren't given credit kind of. He specifically looks at settler artists who painted indigenous people. There's lots of history paintings in which native people are depicted I mean, completely from the colonial perspective. So that view is obviously warped. So he's flipping that on his head. He's refuting themes of disappearance. So a lot of those paintings portray Native Americans as the vanishing race. Um, you see them dying or like being conquered and it's this whole message, but it's like, these people are still here. Like, and that's what's so awesome about taking up so much space in a colonial building like the Met. Yeah, he also includes elements of camp, which is, um, big gay thing. The Met did a huge camp exhibit a while ago that was really cool. I think that has a lot to do with Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. So this one is the one I kind of focused on and it is a model of wash. Oh, I should have censored that and I didn't. So <laughs> that's going to be fun for me in editing. So this, the one I chose, the resurgence of the people, is that right? Or power. Yeah, resurgence of the people is modeled after Washington crossing the Delaware. This you have, um, let me just go back. you can see like the parallels in the composition, very similar, also like Sinclair's painting. Although in Monkman's, there's a whole island over here of um, like settler military guys right here. And I guess, I don't know, oh, is that a cop? I think that might be a cop or like an ICE official. And they're all in modern clothing, um, which is also cool because it's like, I don't know, he could have chosen to put this all in like old like period clothing, but he brought it all into the future kind of, which is, I don't know. I guess that's what like the time traveling he's talking about. You have the big flag and there's all these people and, and wooden boats is also interesting. Let me, where did I write about that? Oh yeah. So the, I guess the exhibition title is I'm going to butcher this, so I'm sorry, but it's uh, Mysticausawak, Mi okay, something like that, um, which means the wooden boat people, and that is the Cree word for when the French arrived, because they arrived in wooden boats. So you have the big wooden boat here. Um, he talked about how he tried to make it parallel, like, yeah, it looks a lot like a migrant vessel, that's what he said. Um, and so you have like people coming in with children also, which I think adds to that. And here, I mean, there's no kids. I think it's all white men um, and some horses. So, um, and yeah, you have also like a black person like saving a white person, two black people saving white people from drowning over here, which is, I mean, you can read into that pretty easily <laughs> what that's supposed to say. Yeah, okay, this one, also, he said that this was supposed to be like welcoming newcomers, which goes along with the venue too. And Miss Chief is like assisting here, which is like supposed to talk about generosity and that whole theme. And I think it's I mean, very telling too, because it's like a people that have been beaten down but are still offering their hands to their oppressors, um, which says a lot. Oh yeah, and then Oh, Miss Chief also is supposed to represent uh, the return to native languages and traditions. And so she's kind of like ushering in this wave of like returning indigenous practices, which is cool too. And that's all I have about that painting, I think. But Miss Chief Eagle Testicle is an artistic persona who was designed to reverse the gaze and look back at European settlers. Uh, he also said that Miss Chief allows him to bring humor to dark chapters. So especially like this one with the Mountie, like there's definitely humor in it. I mean, Miss Eagle Testicle is smirking. So at least she's laughing and I guess I'll censor it. But essentially what we're looking at here is uh, Miss Eagle Testicle wearing a large native headdress and being, I guess, I don't know how to put this not bluntly, but being like sucked off by a Canadian Mountie in some high red, uh, what, pleather, patent leather boots. 
kinky boots boots so it's kind of great and she's glowing so go miss eagle testicle i wanted to find a photo so kent uh monkman also dresses up as miss eagle testicle uh chief eagle testicle so these are some of like the video performances i'm assuming but i think it's really cool that it's like he like physically also adopts this persona and also takes up a lot of space also, uh, Kent Monkman also identifies as two-spirit, which I don't know the formal definition. What does it say? Uh, so Wikipedia says it's a modern pan-Indian umbrella term used by some indigenous North Americans to describe Native people in their community who, who fulfill a traditional third gender or gender variant ceremonial and social role in their cultures. So it's an accepted like queer identity or gender queer identity within native communities so that's also important and you could definitely consider miss chief eagle testicle also two-spirit i would assume let's see oh yeah so some of the other references are history paintings with a lot like this one this is like i don't i can't remember if this is considered a history painting but um this is by william turner and it's a uh, a painting in which a slave ship goes down basically is uh what's what's the word for when ships sink or not okay sink yes <laughs> the ship sinks <laughs> okay oh i literally yeah, wrote I that when i searched it okay good one kendall um okay uh yeah so the ship is sinking and there's what is that sorry okay <laughs> it's okay i was like that is such a creepy little song. okay what was it? It's it's our doorbell. Oh, okay. it sounds our like laundry machine had a song like that. It does sound like um, yeah. It sings a it sings a little <laughs> song. I love it. Okay, so yeah, you have like a sunset and a ship is sinking, and it's kind of hard to make out the people, but there are little people drowning in the water also. So I think this painting is probably referencing that. There's another one that I can't remember right now that I can picture that's also a reference, but you have, so this is welcoming the newcomers for the, those that are not looking at it. And there's a small, uh, what do you call it? Like a dinghy, I guess. Thank you, Max, you put a star on it. It's a little like dinghy where, um, like a wooden ship, which also wooden boats, where so like four white men seem to be falling and reaching out for help and there's like a little shark fin circling around them there's a large island in the left foreground in which you have lots and lots of people um and lots and lots of gazes some are nude some are clothed yeah and uh, there's some people reaching for help uh, a black person in chains maybe a slave um and a white i think conquistador because of his helmet Lots of people trying to climb back onto the island. There's like a naked white woman who's staring directly at us, which is interesting. I guess nude because it's art. But um, yeah, and then three white men. One of them's being pulled up by a native woman. There's a baby. There's, I think, a pregnant woman maybe giving birth or has just given birth because she's next to this baby and holding her stomach. There's like a woman behind her who's like holding her breasts and like moaning, but not in like a positive way it doesn't look like and another kind of like I think it's supposed to parallel flag it's a I, I don't know what you'd call that I'm not educated enough in this topic but it's like a pole with feathers attached and I'll, I'll find out later and update but um yeah so that's that one really cool paintings and Oh, just one more thing. He also talked about some inspiration was uh, the signing of treaties. So I guess maybe that's where you have this like cooperation element. Three paintings, he talked about that. And also the beginning of residential school systems um, was something he was thinking about, I guess, when he made this. And that was something that really acted as an oppressive force towards Native people and um, was intentionally trying to strip them of their culture by re-educating their children very violent yeah and also just referencing like the removal of native people so yeah that's kent monkman in a very brief summary i wish i had more time to talk about it but yeah, yeah. any questions or thoughts or... yeah is kent monkman a performance artist himself 
Yeah, so I think so, because he dresses up as uh, Chief, uh, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. So yeah, I think, I think you could definitely categorize him that way. So, yeah, it does a, a lot of different medias, so. Media, yeah. <laughs> Anything from Claire, Max? I liked it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but yeah, you can see like lots of parallels to yeah. Sinclair's, yeah. Yeah. I think it's cool. Oh. Go ahead, Max. I think it's really cool just because it's like it's like an even more extreme way of like punching upward, I think. Whereas I think like I think like maybe the first step in like recognizing those atrocities and in, in like paintings has been um recently just like making light of them in a painting mm -hmm. and like showing the struggles in a painting but now like putting it in that lens where it's like you know from this point of view and like really looking at like the white people in a really like reductive point of view is mm -hmm. like really funny I think mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and I mean it's in the Met like it's one of the most famous museums worldwide for sure and it's huge i mean i've walked past it many times because it's right next to where the coat uh coat check is so you're like in line standing right next to it and you can like pick out because there's so many details which i think is also probably intentional because like as a viewer if you're sitting waiting in the lobby of the met like there's so many things to look at and enjoy and um unpack so it's really cool. And every time I look at it, I notice something new. So I think that's really cool too. What were you gonna say, Sinclair? Yeah, I think they're really cool. I'm really excited about this sort of like showing these moments from a different perspective mm -hmm. um, and also sort of like flipping like images of white saviorism, white conquering power on their heads and showing like the settlers as the weak people who need help and like the native indigenous peoples as like the the strong ones, the light, like the the ones with life and like mm -hmm. babies and vitality and also yeah. the ones who can offer help. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, I thought those were really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I also think like they're the so shark. interesting. What? Like yeah, the go. Shark. This art? <laughs> no, the shark fan. Oh, the shark, yeah. <laughs> and like, I really like the way that the ocean is painted. It's mm -hmm. kind of like those old timey, like, I don't know, like how it's just kind of cartoonish. Oh. I don't know. I don't know if you, if you guys agree. No, yeah, I think so. I but mean... it's almost like, I don't know, it's just interesting. Like this, well, this one specifically, it's like the ocean is almost like, it looks like rocky kind of. Yeah, it looks and like there's concrete. like a pelican it's here like... that I didn't notice. But oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, it's but always like jolting. One, <laughs> I think it's so interesting because like this this ocean is like almost kind of. I mean, it's very like tumultuous, I guess, but mm -hmm. it's almost like kind of uniform. Yeah. And yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I've seen and the pictures. rats. I like the rats. The rats. Oh yeah, the rats. Corner. There's a rats. Oh, and he's holding a cross. In the leftmost corner, bottom left. left. I see that. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. there's two left corners. My bad. How do you <laughs> see that? There are two rats. And the crab is fighting the rat. Yeah. I wonder what that means. I wonder. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what that means at all. Um, well, rats, also, her pumps I mean, I, are beautiful. I just yeah. want to. Well, that's and they're all, red yeah. Louboutins, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's painting that uh, uh, this painting reminded me of that I can't kind of think. Is it the one I'm thinking of? Because I wish I could remember. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, there's one where it's, I'm pretty sure this is the one that he, like, the one I'm thinking of is the one he modeled it after. Though I do think the slave ship painting by Turner, like you see the sunset kind of energy, I think definitely has parallels there. And also there is a slave, so that could also be a reference to slave ship. 
Oh, did the, you think of it? The, yeah, the the raft of, of Medusa or something like that. Oh, yes, yes, that's one. Yes. Okay, this is, wait, let's do, let's see. No, it's a small, there, it's a little there. Yeah, this is the raft of Medusa. The waves do look similar, actually. And this is, I think, oh yeah, so slave ship and the raft of Medusa, I think are depicting the same capsizing of the slave ship, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Oh, Vanessa Walker Rogues really sponsors this podcast. Um, <laughs> Brought to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There is lots of people falling. There is. Oh, and this one I remember it was also controversial because there's a black man here holding a flag at the top, and he's kind of like reaching out towards the future, and all the people are reaching towards him. There's kind of that question of like, is he maybe referencing how everything is built on the backs of slaves? Possibly. Um, and this was wow, that's a controversial take. I mean, especially <laughs> at this time. I mean, 1819, yeah, yeah. height of slavery, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely, I'm sure, got in trouble for that. But yes, so the raft of the Medusa. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> is what this one's about. So yeah. I don't know. There's something about the style of these that feels like really timeless. Like you can mm -hmm. see something in this style, like on the walls of a city hall somewhere exactly yeah mm -hmm. and it totally fits into the met because of that um but then they have like modern clothes and like mm -hmm. the other one has like modern military gear mm -hmm. um, yeah i don't know it's kind of interesting like it it catches you by surprise maybe like you could, mm -hmm. you could look at them and think that they were like in 1900 and then you would have yeah. to like and be like uh, uh that's not what's happening here yeah yeah that's true like it definitely you need a second glance to be like oh this is definitely not that because if you walked past it you might not notice because it fits into the style so well cool <laughs> um do you want to say anything else about your art katie oh sure um I haven't gotten a, really a chance to make a whole lot of film related um, things. Uh, I've been working a lot. So I've been working on sets, um, which has been really fun. Really, really fun, actually. Um, I've been writing a lot. Um, I recently finished my first feature script, Whoa. Um, which is fun and exciting. Come um, to theaters near you. Hopefully, I'm trying to figure out how, like, once you write it, what do you do with it? I don't, I, that's like one thing they've left out of um, education. You'd think um, they'd tell you that. In film you would, school. I know, you would think four years of film school, I'd figure out what to do <laughs> after I've written the script. <laughs> um, but I don't, so I'm trying to sort of figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, if anyone has any ideas please let me know I'd love some advice <laughs> um but yeah I I definitely want to be making more short content once I get back I'm what are you doing in Boston I'm working at a summer camp um like a residential academic -y summer camp so I'm I'll have a floor of fourth and fifth graders but I'm also teaching some classes and right now mm. I'm doing preseason organizational logistic work mm. yeah and then I move in that's fun next weekend nice. fourth and fifth graders that that's a hard age group mm -hmm. I'm excited our campus is fourth through seventh grade and I chose to live with the younger ones because I think they'll respect me more yeah because um, that's that's by fourth actually grade, so smart no seriously because by fourth grade you, you kind of know a good amount of everything yeah so like you're very aware enough fifth graders are conscious back. yeah yeah I've, I've hung out with some fourth graders in my time and i i really enjoy them they've got good questions because mm -hmm. they like they they observe the world mm -hmm. they, yeah that's really exciting well i really have to pee so mm. <laughs>
you should go take care of that. You wanna you wanna wrap it up? Um but I want to talk to you more, Katie. But um I know we'll, we'll have, have you on again personal. I'd love to be on again. This was yeah. so fun. You have no right. idea how excited I was um, when you asked. Um, but we'll also just have like a personal hangout call. Yeah. And you'll be home. So. Um, yeah. Uh, but so you should review this on Apple Podcasts. That would be super cool. Give her five stars. Download her. <laughs> Download her. We love Download. that um and you can watch it on youtube how do we how do we get on apple Podcasts? how do we do that um i use the thing called buzzsprout um thank you so much for having me on yeah thank you katie yay thank you for being our first guest (laughs) (laughs) oh max is toast um Um, it was so fun i would love to do it again if you're ever in need of a guest we shall be okay Bye. Bye. Enjoy your pee. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. I'm missing.